This is already uh, 31st uh, meeting of friends of museums and we are proud that every day it is better and better and more beautiful and more interesting people coming and we all enjoy but today a special day because to today I even did not spend much time I even did not spend much time but mostly Genia Bailey helped me she organized all the schedule all participants and I'll give her uh, maybe a word or not not now just so straight. So then I think that we will let Eve make his presentation. Thank you. As you know from our program, apart from myself, the Eugenia Bailey will talk about what happened uh, to the Russian refugees from Mulangapu who were transported on the U.S. Army Transport to Merit. And I believe we are going to have Marcia Sikovic speak about Angel Island and the reception of the refugees. And finally, Olga Kashina will talk about the social composition and other aspects of the same refugees based on her research of the individual listed on the passenger list for the U.S. Army Transport Merit. Well, first of all, before we can even talk about the Merit and those refugees who made it to San Francisco, we have to set the scene and talk about Rear Admiral Georgi or Yuri Karlovich Stark, who was the last uh, commander of the Siberian flotilla, the dates are on the screen. Uh, it's, uh, he was mostly responsible for evacuating close to 10,000 uh, people from Vladivostok as the so-called uh, People's Revolutionary Army was advancing down the murabyov amir Amurski Peninsula and was taking over the city. A few words of, uh, about the early biography of uh, Rear Admiral Stark. He was born in St. Petersburg on the 20th of October, 1878. He began his studies at the Naval Cadet Corps in 1891 and was considered one of the best cadets in the areas of mathematics and naval science. When he successfully completed his course of studies at the Naval Cadet Corps in 1898, he was promoted to his first rank as an officer of the Baltic Fleet. And as a senior mine officer for the cruiser Avrora, he fought at the Battle of Tsushima during the Russo-Japanese War, was wounded, and the ship he served on was interred in Manila, of all places, until the signing of a peace treaty between Russia and Japan at Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The Aurora and other interned Russian cruisers didn't leave Manila Harbor until the 15th of October, 1905, and finally race arrived at the port of Vibao, Vibava, in February of 1906. For the next six years, he considered, continued to serve on the cruiser Aurora, and in December of 1912, he was promoted to captain of a first rank, Russian naval rank is rather, I'm sorry, second rank. So he had a full captain and then he had a second rank captain. And he was appointed commander of a destroyer called the Sealney. Then during World War I, he was uh, commander of the destroyer Strashny, which was part of the first mine division of the Baltic fleet. He took part in mainly naval operations and battles. And then 1916 was promoted to the rank of uh, Captain First Rank, and in 1917 was appointed commander of the Mine Division, and in this capacity took part in the famous Munzond battle. For his bravery, he was promoted to Rear Admiral on 28th of July, 1917. When the Bolshevik coup took place in October or November by the uh, new calendar of 1917, uh, Stark uh, could not accept their coming to power, and in early 1918, he arrived in the city of Kazan on the Volga River and volunteered as an ordinary soldier in the White Army. Admiral Kolchak soon appointed Stark commander of the Volga Kama White River Flotilla, but after the route of the White Army on the Volga, Rear Admiral Stark covered the retreat of the White Forces from the shores 
uh, out the, along the shores of the river. In the spring of 1919, he was called to Admiral Kolchak's headquarters in Omsk, where Kolchak appointed star commander of a brigade of naval riflemen in Krasnoyarsk. The naval riflemen were meant to be a reliable force for the defense of force ports and vessels, since revolutionary unrest had begun among sailors. In March of 1919, Rear Admiral Snark arrived at the front with the 1st Battalion of Naval Riflemen and took part in battles. After the fall of Omsk to the Reds, the, Reds, excuse me, of the Naval Division joined the ranks of General Kaka's troops and retreated with them to the east. During this famous retreat around Lake Baikal, uh, Stark uh, fell victim to typhus and barely made it to Harbin, where with a great difficulty he finally found work as a construction foreman. On the 20th... That's uh, Stark in 1921 in the Lydia and that's the same picture which we see with the flowers in the back. Um, in May of 1922, uh, the Reds who controlled Vladivostok at the time were overthrown by Russian military who had gathered at Vladivostok and together with the conservative elements on the 26th of May of 1921, a provisional pre-war government headed by the brothers Spiridon and Nikolai Mirkulov came to power and set as one of their main tasks, the rebirth of the Siberian flotilla. They saw Admiral Stark as the best candidate to undertake this mission. He arrived in Vladivostok from Harbin on the 17th of July, 1921, and the following day was appointed commander of the Siberian flotilla. He immediately proposed a plan to make the flotilla combat effective again, and got rid of incompetent people, good-for-nothings, and sailors infected with revolutionary ideas. Here we see the, the types of vessels that were available uh, to the Siberian flotilla. Most of the real battleships had been transferred to the Baltic fleet during World War I. So what was left was mostly some light destroyers, transport vessels, auxiliary transports, tugboats, and the like. Uh, the uh, Siberian flotilla basically was reduced to patrolling uh, the shores of the several seas, mostly around the Muravyov and Morsky Peninsula, and then along the coast of the maritime region. Uh, here they encountered uh, Red Partisans and also Chinese uh, pirates. Thanks to the efforts of Admiral Stark and his assistants, they managed to get the situation under control, and this, the region was very quiet. <coughs> Here we see some of uh, Stark's assistants, officers, and as well as uh, the famous uh, general uh, Pipiyaev, uh, who would head an expedition to the Kamchatka uh, Peninsula. As mentioned earlier, Stark uh, was chosen by members of the Primor uh, government uh, to head up the Siberian flotilla. And here we see Stark's uh, chief of staff, Captain Famin, Admiral Stark himself, and Spiridon and Nikolai Dionisovich Mirkulov, who were head of the executive branch of the government. Another photograph uh, showing Stark and his uh, chief of staff. And what is important to point out is uh, that although the anti-communist pro provisional pre-war government came uh, to power in Vladivostok shortly after it celebrated its first anniversary, uh, the political situation began to heat up. Uh, there was a position between the executive branch and the legislative branch. The so-called uh, Popular Assembly declared uh, the overthrow of the executive branch headed by the Mirkulov uh, brothers, and they were supported 
by General Molchanov and some of the former Kapilite officers. However, although uh, Rear Admiral Humal, uh, Stark uh, saw uh, that the government of the Nirkulov brothers had no real future, he remained loyal to it and uh, defended the building in which the government presided and even sent naval riflemen to maintain order in the city. While this was happening, and here we see those uh, naval uh, riflemen who were defending the government building. Uh, in early June of 1922, while all of this was going on, uh, Admiral Stark was given uh, dictatorial powers. He was appointed commander of the armed forces of the provisional pre-war government while remaining commander of the Siberian flotilla. Uh, but on uh, June 11th, Stark decided to decline command of all the armed forces. Despite the departure from power of the Mirkulov brothers, the admiral's position really didn't change. The next uh, person commanding the Russian Far East, General M. K. Dietrichs, when he came to power, appointed Stark, his assistant for naval affairs, with the powers of a naval minister. And in addition, as uh, continue, uh, conditions started to deteriorate in the pre war region, uh, Stark was appointed head of tactical rear areas, thus being responsible for order in all the maritime province. Even army commanders were made subordinate to him. But uh, the situation really became difficult as the Japanese, who had been intervening in Russian affairs in the Russian Far East since uh, April of 1918, decided uh, to evacuate the region, and they were the main source of support. Were it not for them, the Russian Far East would have been communist even earlier. The Japanese signed an agreement with the, uh, Red, uh, with the Reds that they would leave the pre war region by October, the end of October of 1922. And as they were basically all that uh, they controlled all the munitions and everything else, uh, the material that was necessary for the White Army, uh, conditions became untenable. Uh, they, So by the end of uh, September of 1922, a crisis was reached and everything had to be focused on trying to defend what was left of uh, territory unoccupied by Red Partisans. Uh, General uh, Dietrichs, who headed the, pre which was now called the Priyamursky Zemsky Krai, and the army, uh, issued an order uh, temporarily closing all institutions of learning and the military colleges, and he called to arms students. On the 6th of October, the Red, Red Army, the Reds, uh, began an offensive, and uh, they received reinforcements from the Zabaikal region. After 12 uh, days of heavy fighting, it became clear that the struggle uh, couldn't uh, long, last much longer. There was a, a, a shortness of rifle bullets, and uh, General Dietrichs uh, considered that uh, trying to hold on to a territory with just artillery and uh, swords and knives against the uh, uh, against the uh, machine guns and uh, uh, rifles. Uh, was not possible. Uh, here we see uh, the size of the Siberian flotilla towards the start of October, as well as listing how many uh, officers there were uh, per ship and so forth. So, at uh, this point, after it became clear that there would have to be some kind of evacuation and uh, there were basically uh, the, that basically there was a discussion of several possibilities for evacuation. 
but it was decided ultimately that uh, General Dietrichs would retreat uh, with uh, the army by land, whereas uh, those uh, parts of the uh, Siberian flotilla that remained in Vladivostok, including family members, um, naval uh, bureaucrats, uh, cadets, and other refugees, would be transported uh, by sea to the Korean port of Ginzan. Here we see the ultimate route of the evacuation of people by uh, the ships of the Siberian flotilla to the Philippines. Um, on the 23rd of October, uh, Rear Admiral Stark, uh, commanding the Siberian flotilla, issued an order in which he indicated that the evacuation would take place by the evening of the following day and that close to 10,000 people will be involved in the evacuation. Uh, in a, the rush, uh, a squadron was uh, put together of uh, various uh, ships which had long uh, outserved their, their their possibilities. So, for example, there were some gunboats, some uh, trawlers, icebreakers, military transports, uh, passenger and uh, uh, supply ships, and just uh, commercial ships of the volunteer fleet, as well as those belonging to private uh, companies. The uh, order issued by Admiral Stark was calibrated by the hour and all, it was carried out precisely uh, within the time frame allotted. By the 11th hour, of 11 p.m. on the 24th of October, Vladivostok uh, was basically uh, if, uh, abandoned by what remained of white forces there and uh, by the night of the 26th of October, the ships gathered in Spasyat, which was basically the last Russian port prior to Korea. And they set uh, forth for the port of Ginzan, or what I believe is now called Wonsan in Korea. So there it was decided that the ships would make a brief stop and uh, having selected more serviceable vessels, Stark uh, set sail for Shanghai. Uh, his arrival there was completely unexpected. Unfortunately, when the uh, Siberian flotilla set sail, the government, uh, the white government of Vladivostok had very few diplomatic contacts, and they were unable to inform uh, people outside the region of what their plans might be. So uh, the reception in some places was quite hostile when, for example, the flotilla decided to purchase uh, coal. They were sold to secondhand, very bad coal and uh, material. Uh, here we see uh, some photographs uh, taken while the Siberian flotilla was making its way down the coast. I forgot to mention that because most of the vessels were in very bad condition, they couldn't really go far out to sea and they had to hug the coast. On the right, we see the military transport of Hotsk standing at Ginzan, and it was taken over by troops of General Gliabov. Another ship, the gunboat Mabinit, was standing uh, near the island of Formosa, what is now Taiwan, at Takao, and we see one of the officers of the fleet, Captain Ilyin, surrounded by uh, Japanese officials and officers. Um, this uh, young officer uh, was later a member of the Naval Officers Association here in San Francisco, and what's kind of funny is he notes on the back of the photograph that shortly after this picture was taken, there was a very strong wind, and he lost his cap. <laughs> All right, having um, uh, arrived.
arrived in Shanghai, the ships uh, then headed for Manila. It, this was the ultimate destination because Admiral Stark was convinced that in, only once uh, the flotilla reached territory controlled by Americans, uh, his, he and his uh, passengers would be safe. Uh, there was a conflict between the military and the naval side. Uh, for example, here we have an order to General Lebedev uh, countermanding an order which he had issued. So things uh, nearly came to a fight uh, between the naval side and the army side. Well, ultimately, uh, this, after this uh, squadron uh, proceeded uh, to uh, head for Manila, and upon arriving there, the uh, Vice Admiral sold the remainder of his flotilla and ships of the volunteer fleet. Proceeds from the sale were split equally among the officers and men of the former Siberian flotilla. Of course, we will hear about uh, the uh, stay of uh, Russian refugees at, at Olongpo, Olongpo and who, those who headed ultimately for San Francisco, but it must be remembered that the refugee camp survived for almost a year, and those for whom there was no room to go to the United States ultimately went to Australia, to China, and some, including the Admiral, even went as far away as France. So here we have an early photograph of the flotilla while in the Philippines. Finally, we have a picture of Admiral Stark and his staff. These are the 11 uh, commanders of what was left of the flotilla by the time it made it to the Philippines. And I'm showing this photograph basically because when we talk about the passengers of the Merit, all of them, as well as all other members of the Siberian flotilla and refugees prior to leaving, the Philippines received an autographed picture of the Admiral, and this particular photo was actually taken and printed in the Philippines. And this is the ship on which 586 members of the Siberian flotilla and their families would leave the Philippines for the United States in May of 1923. So very briefly, that's about the Admiral, his fleet, and some of his passengers. Now I would like to give the microphone over to our next speaker who will tell you in much more detail about the passengers of this particular ship. Thanks for your attention. I just have one question, so very interesting photos, and I think that everybody will be interested from where did you catch them, all of them. Okay, uh, apart from uh, two photos, all of the photos come from collections of our museum. For example, we have a photo album which belonged to Rear Admiral Stark. It was then at the Cayute Campania or Association of Former Russian Naval Officers in Paris. In turn, they sent it to the Naval Officers Association in San Francisco. And in the 1970s, the album was transferred to our museum. So a lot of the pictures that you saw are from that particular album. Then we have the two portraits of the Admiral, which were once held by Anatoly Lukashkin in his personal archive in his garage, but when his grandson uh, turned them over to us, they were added to a collection devoted to the Russian Civil War in Siberia and the Russian Far East. And finally, we must mention that the two photographs which aren't from us are from the Hoover Institution Archives, the collection of Boris Krukov. Some of the photos which we have are duplicated in the Krukov collections. They're just independent prints made from the same negatives. So you'll see that I could have added more pictures from Krukov's collection, which would basically duplicate what we have. But I thought it'd be more important for us to demonstrate what we have in our collections. No, it's a big pleasure. I want to introduce a so energetic woman. Thank you very much. If not she, 
we would not be here and we would not hear so interesting composition of different stories all together. I think that maybe it is happening maybe even first time. Thank you, Zhenya. So, <clears throat> January the 23rd, the uh, ships of the flagella began to arrive at the Philippines. And they congregated at Port Bolognese. And when the whole fleet arrived there, they continued on to Medivedos. And the following day, doctors boarded each ship to inspect for cleanliness and any diseases. The crew was sent to the bathhouses and showers. The women were housed in barracks. All the clothes were fumigated. And every one received a vaccination. The next day, General Wood came to meet with Admiral Stark. And he made note to see what could be done to accommodate the Russians. And he said that he would also continue corresponding with Washington for further details. Meanwhile, a large amount of produce was delivered on the ship through the courtesy of the United States. The ships were given water and coal. And the government of the Philippines provided the paint and the materials needed to spruce up the ships. Also, they received a large amount of clothing. It was used, but it was freshly clean. Gym classes, they had uh, 
They were able to study English, and the children were sent to Philippine schools. the way to Omogapo and a view of Omogapo. This is Stark's office in Omogapo and it's actually the official, his official working place, also his residence. Meanwhile, steps were taken to find out ways that these refugees get to the United States to seek political asylum. And uh, things were working rather quickly. And Admiral Stark was told that to um, he had to uh, decommission ships. And this would be his first step towards authorizing the members decided. So he ordered a dress parade on March the 23rd. The ships are all decorated with flags and banners. And at 12 o'clock noon, Admiral Starr gave his command, strike ensigns. The commandant replied, hand salute. And as the band played the Imperial Russian Hymn, the naval flag was slowly lowered. Silence reigned. There wasn't a dry eye in the crowd. This was the end of the world-renowned Imperial Russian Navy. Admiral received a telegram saying that there would be a ship coming to Alangofo and they could accommodate 550 Russians to California. And May the 23rd, the Merit arrived at Alangofo. And after a five day stay, they departed for California. But the day of the departure, a half hour before the ship left, Admiral Starr came aboard with some of his officers and gave a very touching speech recalling their arduous, tortuous trip and how he felt so sorry they had to part with them. And as the mirror slowly started to slip away from the port, Admiral Stark, with a few of his officers, were in the launch, and they gave a resounding farewell as the ship headed for California. Now, Lieutenant Fuller was in charge of the Russian immigrants, and 
he made sure that the volunteer crew had their necessary jobs to maintain the workings of the merit. Uh, they were offered physical exercise classes. They were encouraged to take English, as a matter of fact, demanded that they take English classes. And also the Red Cross kept uh, <coughs> informing the Russians as to what kind of jobs were available. They said jobs were plentiful. There were fruit pickers, they were working in the mills, and there were carpenters. And it seemed like everybody wanted to be a fruit picker. So, their first stop was Honolulu. June the 20th, they approached Pier number five, and as they anchored at the pier, the band was playing the Star Spangled Banner. And then they were playing Hawaiian melodies, and uh, dancing ladies were standing to wait for the signal to start dancing. Uh, there were newspaper people, there were cameras, there were movie tones. It was over, it was absolutely chaos. And the Russians were amazed at the reception that they were getting. Later on in the day, the Honolulu dignitaries came aboard and some of the newspaper individuals came aboard. The following day, the American Red Cross planned a treat for the Russians. They walked them over to a very popular parking place that was reserved for picnics, and they gave them a special luncheon treat. A half a ton of pineapple, fresh pineapple for lunch, through the courtesy of the Hawaiian Pineapple Canning Company, and a half a ton was sent to the ship. The youngsters were given milk and cookies. And after their lunch, there was time to stroll in the waters of Pearl Harbor and also along the beach. And at 4 o'clock, they lined up to trek back to the ship. The next day, the Hawaiian Automobile Association was able to get 150 automobiles to come to the dock and to spend two hours with three or four passengers taking them around the island and showing them the sights. The children were given ice cream and chocolates. Some of the men got cigars and the women got flowers. And later on in the afternoon, they were, they delivered an enormous amount of clothing which the Russians badly needed. And the next day, they displayed display the clothing on the deck so everybody could make choices. And the things that went fast were the Hawaiian shirts. So, fortunately, <coughs> there was a seamstress on the ship and she had her sewing machine with her and she was busy altering clothes because the Russians wanted to look their best when they got to California. In time, they were getting close to San Francisco. July <coughs> 1st, early in the morning, the Merritt slipped into San Francisco Harbor. A little foggy. They headed northeast and anchored at the docks of Angel Island, opposite the immigration station. Later on, the uh, dignitaries went aboard from the 
immigration station, newspapers, again, it was pandemonium. Newspaper men, cameras, <coughs> movie, movies were taken. The next day, the Russians were led to the immigration station, and it was time to say goodbye to the mirror.
The immigration station at Angel Island did not have sufficient quarters to deal with 526 uh, applicants for admission, and the Army made room for them at Fort McDowell, not that far away on the uh, Angel Island. The processing by the immigration inspectors was the last step in the long, difficult journey from Vladivostok. For most, it went smoothly. Even though the refugees in the Philippines had been carefully screened with regards to help and for compliance with the immigration laws, at least 31 individuals had to appear before boards of special inquiry. This was a panel of three immigration inspectors who would probe. The uh, original inspector would be concerned about something, so he'd send the uh, family or the individual to appear before the, to these boards of special inquiry. If the board decided to exclude an immigrant, she or he could eventually uh, appeal the decision. But while the appeals were moving through the bureaucracy, immigrants remained at the immigration station. Unfortunately, the general and case files for the merits arrival and passengers seem not to have survived. So we have just little pieces of, it's mainly the ship's manifest and the record of the Board of Special Inquiries. Uh, I, uh, I don't expect you to be able to read, but this is a ship's manifest. It's got all sorts of notes on it. Um, this one is just a piece of it. I'll refer to it later. Um, and it actually follows an immigrant if they apply for citizenship. So some of these scribbled notes don't apply to their initial uh, inspection, but to years later when they are applying for citizenship. And it's, this, this manifest acts as a confirmation of legal entry. So we only get a partial story about these boards of special inquiry. For example, the Zong family spent 10 days at Angel Island, perhaps because they arrived without a visa. They were paroled rather than admitted, which meant that the uh, immigration service could keep tabs on them until they received um, formal admission. Four of the 526 who arrived were deported back to the Philippines and they would have spent more weeks at the immigration station. I just want to mention two items that I found very interesting from these um, passenger lists. One was a striking number of farmers, laborers, sailors, and a variety of skilled workers. Unusual, at least in my research, among the population leaving Russia during and after the Civil War, which was more typically educated middle and upper class. Uh, my colleague, Vlada um, Kremsina, has been doing some research on these lists and finds that some of the sailors were indeed uh, officers. The other thing that was interesting, that there were 17 adult age individuals, that is over the age of 16, who could not pass the literacy test. Very unusual in my research experience. And I mentioned earlier that the immigration officials had made a concession for this particular group of refugee immigrants. And the literacy requirement was waived. It had been a law since 1917, and it had been used at San Francisco to uh, prohibit the entry of many immigrants. During World War I, for instance, refugees from the Eastern Front in Russia, who arrived at San Francisco unable to read and write, were excluded. Um, in the case of the merit refugees, this literacy requirement was waived on the grounds that if the refugees returned, they faced religious persecution. <coughs> Indeed, I feel um, special treatment was accorded to these refugees. I just want to make one more comment about the quota law before I talk about help. While the merits passengers, in terms of the quota law, did not run into any problems, most of the Russian passengers of the two ships that arrived in 
July on the 12th and the 15th, which is about 150 passengers, could not be admitted because the quota law or the quota had been filled by the passengers of the Merit. Some, um, quite a number, over 60 remained at the immigration station for three months. Some took the advice of the Commissioner of Immigration, went back uh, to, in this case, uh, Yokohama, and made sure they got on a boat so they could arrive in time for the September quota. The first um, source of further help, that is help in California or in San Francisco, many of the adult refugees, even before they left the island, found employment through the efforts of the Russian Relief, uh, Russian Refugee Relief Society of America. This was an organization primarily of Americans that had been established to help in the resettlement of refugees from Constantinople. The society was based in New York, but had sent a representative to San Francisco to direct finding employment and housing. Charles Riley, on loan from the International YMCA, spoke Russian, and indeed he had worked for some years in Russia. His first efforts, however, to organize in San Francisco resulted in a resounding no to helping the married refugees. The Council of Social and Health Agencies, the Community Chest, the Building Trades and Labor Councils, the Chamber of Commerce, the Industrial Association insisted that the refugee situation was one of national rather than community concern and that the Red Cross should be foot in the bill. Eventually, however, the Chamber of Commerce called together the heads of several large industrial institutions and men found jobs on the railroad, in the machine shops at Southern Pacific, on San Francisco streetcar lines, picking fruit. Um, they found jobs in lumbering and in other areas. The International Institute of the uh, YWCA supervised the placement of women and girls, but I don't have any specifics about that. In September, despite their earlier reluctance, the San Francisco Community Chess provided further funding for the Russian Refu Refugee Relief Society through the end of the year, and the International Institute hired a Russian, Mr. Yakovlev, to provide social services to men. Another source of help was the church. Just a month before the um, merit arrived, the visiting bishop Theophilus noted in the Holy Trinity Cathedral Pastoral Journal. He wrote, the rector of the church and his co-workers in the organization of parish life show care and concern for the amelioration of life of those newly arriving. As early as the fall 1920, the rector of Holy Trinity Cathedral, Father Vladimir Sakovich, had written in the journal, the waves of refugees rolls up to the shores of America. The need for an organization of a nonpartisan Russian society is obvious. A society where both local citizens and newly arriving Russians can find a place for meeting each other and for discussions, etc. On October the 3rd, he noted that a meeting of the Russians took place in the evening. They decided to organize a Russian club. Temporarily, the entire first floor of the church house is ceded to the club. Note that he's encouraging experienced parishioners to help the new arrivals. In November, he noted, after liturgy, the general meeting of parishioners <coughs> and the Women's Society took place. It was decided to organize a concert and bazaar on December 17th. The profit is to be equally divided between the Women's Society and the club. So, He's, he's encouraging as many people as possible to get involved in helping these, uh, all, all refugees, not just the ones from America. 
And throughout 1922 and 1923, the Pastoral Journal reiterates that the church is filling up with newly arriving refugees and that gatherings are arranged for the purpose of getting together and acquainting ourselves with the new arrivals and for unifying the community. In 1923, he noted, it is obvious that the temple has become too small. During divine liturgy, so many people are gathering by the gates and fence. There they find new acquaintances and socialize, but sometimes their loud shouting destroys the solemnity of the temple where the mystery of the Eucharist is taking place. The church represented perhaps the only piece of the refugees' former lives to have survived, and that in itself was a form of consolation. It also became, in these early years of the 1920s, a social center. Not only the Russian club, but other groups formed there. By 1922, there was a library, a reading room, a Russian school had formed. After church, people met and exchanged information and informal help from each other. Had, uh, parishioners learned about work possibilities, rooms for rent, and the latest gossip. The church also functioned as a post office. 1520 Green Street was the general delivery of this growing Russian colony. In 1931, Dr. Grigory Maximov noted, as more and more new Russian refugees arrived, Father Vladimir was the first person to whom they very naturally turned. All new <coughs> those who had no family or friends, those who had no knowledge of English, and those in many difficult situations. George Belokshin was one of those without family, having left them in Chabadis. Many years later, he remembered, next Sunday I went to church again and met Father Sokovich and told him my story of leaving Shanghai and my trip as a stowaway on the Canadian winter and that I was looking for a job. He was interested and he told me that the sugar company was hiring men and he gave me the address of the factory. If anybody wanted to know something, it would be said, see Father Sokovich. Vladimir Barkov, who arrived about 1930, wrote a year later, on the first day of my arrival in San Francisco in the evening, I became acquainted with Father Sokovich in church and was astounded by his warmth sincerity, how he could simply approach a person and show much kindness and leave an indelible impression. In daily life, moreover, how accessible he was, unpretentious, warm, responsive, and sensitive to another's woe or sorrow. So here was a priest who cared deeply about his flock. He was very well connected with a variety of people in the American community. For example, the Call Bulletin editor, Fremont Older, Episcopal Church clergy, San Francisco mayor, the International Institute considered him a foreign leader resource, to mention only a few. He was very hands-on in getting things done and helping his parishioners. On the left is a photo where he's on Fremont Older's ranch, and in 1920 he was picking fruit himself because there was no income for his uh, position as rector. And on the right, it's uh, the, the snapshot is from 1918. Father Vladimir is on the roof near the chimney. This was an exercise in painting the church. He was remembered for decades after his death uh, because he made visits to arriving ships, on, he uh, got on the ferry that took um, immigrants from the ship to Angel Island, and he also made trips to Angel Island to meet uh, new arrivals. And I just want to cite three examples from his 1930 diary, simply because they are specific. Um, they were examples such as such as these were current throughout his 12 years. On the, 30, on the uh, 31st of January, he takes three men, one of whom 
was a recent arrival to see about work at the Southern Pacific Building. On the 1st of March, he met uh, Mr. Malitsky at the immigration station, and by the afternoon, he had found a room for him for a week in the Broadway apartments. On the 6th of September, he writes about two of the rivals that he met on the ferry uh, from Angel Island. One of them was Zina Volodvodskaya. She was en route to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, Vysyevolod uh, Kaczorowski was on his way to Cleveland. He takes both of them to the Traveler's Aid Society to meet Miss Elkins. Two days later, he takes um, Miss Volodvodskaya to Southern Pacific to buy a ticket for Winston-Salem. And the next day, he and one of his daughters takes her to the ferry as she begins or continues her journey for North Carolina. And just one other example of his reach. Oops. Uh, Westwood was a lumbering community in Lassen County in California, and indeed some of the merit uh, men may have found work there. Uh, these photos are from 1924. The one on the right is after a funeral service that he has conducted. It was not unusual for him to be conducting services in general, including funerals, at Santa Cruz, Angel's Camp, and in this case at the uh, Westwood. Not only refugees from the Merritt called on him, but many others throughout his relatively short years of service. They called on him and they called on his Matushka, Maria Matveev. She told just because a real talk with different people. So, so I have conducted research on the um, passengers uh, from the Marriott already for a couple years, and I was able to trace the fate more than 400 refugees from the Marriott, and I was amazed uh, their diversity. Uh, Masha mentioned this uh, already. They were indeed the part of Russia, outside of Russia, because among them they were representatives of all estates and classes of pre-revolutionary Russian society. Among them were aristocrats, uh, officers of the imp uh, Imperial Russian Army and Navy, Kazakhs, um, there were uh, a lot of um, fishermen, workers, laborers, so it was indeed part of Russia, outside of Russia. They were from all parts, from all corners of multicultural, multi-religious, and multinational Russian Empire, which uh, before the revolution included also territory of Poland and Finland. They have, some of them had excellent education, one of the best in Europe, and uh, particularly people from military families, they had the education equivalent to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and the U.S. Military Academy in the West Point, while others uh, had only finished only a couple grades in elementary school, and some of them were illiterate. Um, among the 526 passengers uh, of the transport Marriott, there were 327 single men 
and two single women. Among them, there were not only men that who were never married, but who also widowed passengers whose spouses died uh, or were killed during the Civil War, and those who were separated from their families by the tragic events of the forced migration. It was exactly the case uh, of uh, Serge Denisov, who was um, a priest on the merit. Father Denisov kept up the spirit of the refugees, but himself suffered separation uh, from his wife and children, whom he lost in Siberia. On the merit, there were 69 married couples, many of whom were married in Vladivostok uh, during the last days of uh, their being in their home country and in the Philippines before uh, embarking on the merit. Eight women were pregnant and they gave birth to their children already in San Francisco. Some passengers of the Marriott were very lucky because they were able to immigrate to the United States with other members of their families. On the Marriott, there were 33 full families, which included both parents and children. Mainly, there were families of the officers and uh, Caspian fishermen. In order to make history alive, I would like to tell you briefly uh, the story of four families. One of them was the family of um, Pyotr Ivanovich Hiskanin. He is here at the center and he was the head of the refugees in the Mayor. Admiral Stark uh, offered, uh, asked, uh, Pyotr Ivanovich to be the leader of the refugees uh, for three main reasons. First of all, uh, Pyotr Ivanovich had uh, the highest ra military rank uh, among officers um, on the Marriott. He was major general. Secondly, because of his uh, military service, he was a veteran of Russo-Japanese War and World War I and definitely uh, the civil war. And finally, he was the oldest member on the, uh, among the passengers uh, of the Marriott. He was already 63 years old. So on the Marriott, um, Pyotr Hiskanin was with his wife and two sons, uh, Boris and George. These, these pictures were made uh, 25 years before departure of Merit to San Francisco. And on this picture, um, th this picture, this is Boris Hiskanian and George Hiskanian. Both of them became naval officers. Boris graduated from St. Petersburg Naval Academy in 1916 and uh, some uh, uh, graduates from this academy were also on the merit. Both sons, uh, both George and uh, uh, Boris, they fought against the Bolsheviks in the Russian Far East and played an active role in the Stark Flotilla as well on the merit. The largest family on the Marriott was the family of Andrei Ivanovich Kolosov, a colonel of the Russian Imperial Army, and it's a great honor because today we have here a great granddaughter of Andrei Ivanovich and great, great, great son. Is it correct? Yep. Of Andrei Ivanovich Kolosov. Uh, like uh, Pyotr Hiskanin, who was um, also a veteran of the Russo-Japanese War and World War I. On the Marriott, there were 15 people related to the Kolosa family, including, including his wife, something happened? 
не переводится. Извините, все, все, все работает сейчас. Okay. Including, uh, including his wife and seven children. So they were three, three sons and four daughters. And also four sons in law. They were, uh, two of them were naval officers. It was Vyacheslav Svinsinsky and Mikhail Panimatopoulos. Oh, okay. Because it's a Greek name and later he became known like Michael Pola. And also two naval officers, uh, um, Vladimir Sharonov and Viktor Goldberg. The youngest member of the Kolosov family was the two-year-old Marina, daughter of Kira and Vyacheslav Sinzinsky. So this is Marina, this is her father, right? Um, during the forced migration, a colonial Andrei Kolosov wrote diaries describing their journey. In 1997, Marina published a diary with help from her husband. But since the number of copies was limited, the book immediately became uh, a rarity. But I know that the book and archives of Andrei Kolosev is preserved in, in the cover archive. Yeah, Marina turned out to be the last passenger of the married who died in California in January 2015, two weeks before her 94th birthday. Another family, uh, it's family of Boris Vladimirovich von Zon. So uh, this is German name because the first zones began to serve uh, in the Russian Navy during the rule of, Cape, uh, of Catherine the Great. And this is from uh, Zon, uh, Vladimir from Zon, in his uh, early, early age. He started his naval career in 1909 after the graduation from St. Petersburg Naval Academy. Uh, on the married, he was with his wife and five children, three of whom were his uh, stepchildren. During the uh, Russian Civil War, he fought against the Reds in the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It was at that time when the Caspian fishermen, under the leadership of naval officers uh, John Tachirian, joined the white movement and began to serve as sailors on the Caspian flotilla. When the whites were defeated, naval officers and sailors of these members of their families retreated from Baku. So uh, mostly fishermen were from Astrakhan and they retreated from Baku to the Iranian um, port and Syria which was under the British control. In agreement with the British military forces, former members of the Caspian, uh, Caspian flotilla, as well as Kazakhs, were placed in the British internment camp uh, near Basra, Mesopotamia, where they spent almost two years. Nine of the 60 children of the married were born in Basra, including Zons and the children's sons. All of the Russian refugees in Basra received the nickname Mesopotamia. In October 1921, the British repatriated them from Basra to Vladivostok. This picture depicts the group of former Russian officers and sailors who were detainees in the Basra camp. Two years later, many of them would be on the merit. Of these members of their families, they comprise a uh, comprised almost half of the passengers of the Marriott. That is why Admiral St Stark appointed Boris von Zon as the main assistant of General Hiscani to work with US refugees and US immigration services. So in this picture, I, I lost picture, it, it's uh, the I, I believe this is this is Fonzon. 
and it's also <coughs> in another picture with uh, his cunning, he is also presented in the picture. In Vladivostok, many naval officers and sailors from the Basra camp joined the Siberian flotilla to fight with the Bolsheviks. And uh, you know already this part because we started uh, our events with this uh, if presentation. So I will stop here and maybe only one more picture. Maybe some of you know this man. No? This is Zhenia uh, Tachilin. He was born in Basra, in, in the uh, refugee camp in Basra. So then, with his family, he um, traveled from Basra, from Mesopotamia to Vladivostok. And then from Vladivostok uh, to the Philippines, and from the Philippines to the United States of America. So his, the whole of his childhood, like all others, uh, children on the married, it, it was in the refugee camps. And look at his face, how he's happy because he achieved his American dream. He became uh, a very famous scientist, and I think this is uh, this smiling face. It's the best evidence that. Russian refugees from the Marriott find uh, happiness in the United States and for them the United States became really the second motherland. Okay, thank you. Мне кажется, что просто прекрасное выступление. Большое спасибо, огромная работа вот за, за каждым предложением. Это огромное... О, oh, sorry. So, this is behind the every sentence of Olga, it is huge job, and so I just appreciate not only your presentation, but even what is behind the presentation. Thank you very much. A few words for Jane. who is president of our museum, he told me, Margarita, do you know that uh, Mila Bobrova. Bobrova, Mila Bobrova, her father was in Philippines and he did not come with, with uh, Flotilla to San Francisco. He uh, stayed in Philippines and I am thank I'm thankful to my husband. He came and asked her to make a short presentation, five minutes. Do we have five minutes to see it? Okay, please. Hello, my name is Lyudmila Alexandrovna Bobrov, and I'm the daughter of White Army Cavalryman Alexander Vladimirovich Zhitkov. Alexander Vladimirovich 
arrived in the Philippines on one of the ten ships that Admiral Stark commanded from Shanghai after the evacuation of the White Army from Vladivostok in 1922. Contrary to the belief that only one Russian remained in the Philippines after Admiral Stark departed for San Francisco, that was incorrect according to my father. Those who decided to remain in the Philippines were men who found jobs quickly in Manila or its outskirts and rapidly learned Spanish and the Filipino language Tagalog. What appealed to these former White Army soldiers was the warm tropical weather, the friendly and helpful natives, and the fact that the Philippine Islands were, was a protectorate of the United States. Papa found a job quickly. I will show you a picture of Papa. Okay. Papa found a job quickly because he had studied chemistry in Moscow University for two years and had worked at a laboratory in Russia before the revolution began. He was confident in his ability to work in a laboratory and applied for a job at the largest sugar plantation in the Philippines called Tabacalera. He was hired immediately to work in their lab. His friend from the White Army days, Viktor Zibarov, also found a job at a toy factory, as did the other men from the ship. Before long, they formed a small community and enjoyed gathering at the Manila Hotel on weekends. The decision to stay in, in Manila was the right one for my father because eventually he became head of the Tabacalera Laboratory. And here he is sitting at the desk with all of the uh, Filipino chemists working with him on sugar. Um, Yes, um, with his promotion, he received a large house from the company, as well as a maid and a chauffeur. In the mid-1930s, the Bacalera granted him a six-month sabbatical to travel around the world with all expenses paid. As the city of Manila grew, more and more Russians arrived to start businesses or open branches for their companies. A Russian Orthodox Church, named after the Ivoran Mother of God icon, was conse consecrated in the city. Then in 1939, my mother, Yevgenia Kirillovna Sudnikova, came from Shanghai to visit her friends, Viktor and Tamara Zibarov. They introduced her to Alexander Vladimirovich, and five days later, Papa proposed. Life was wonderful for everyone until the Japanese invaded the Philippines in 1941. Then we all lived in difficult wartime conditions until the United States General Douglas MacArthur recaptured the islands in 1945, as he had promised to do when he retreat, uh, retreated. With great joy, our family immigrated to the United States soon after the war ended in 1946, and we ended up in San Francisco. Maybe somebody has some questions to ask right here, <coughs> or we have another possibility, we just clean this room, we will put some uh, drinks, and kirashki of course, fresh, freshly made, to Today in the morning. Okay, so... <laughs> I, I have a question, but first I wanted to thank uh, 
to thank the organizers and all the speakers for such a wonderful, wonderful uh, morning and afternoon such this is really spectacular. Um, my question is, there was a Russian poet, Arseny Nismelov, in China, and his most famous poem concerns a small group of naval cadets stuck in Vladivostok after the fleet had left, Admiral Stark's fleet had left. And supposedly, according to the poem, they commandeered a small sailing vessel and sailed across the Pacific directly to San Francisco. And he wrote a poem, an epic poem about this. And later, this poem kind of became the stuff of legend and it became very well known among Russian emigres, and everybody refers to this boat. Now, I have never actually been able to discover this voyage. It seems like it's, um, it is indeed just a legend, but perhaps some of the speakers, have you heard about this? Uh, do you recognize it? Or is it uh, indeed just a, just a figment of Nisvelo's imagination? All right, well, does the boat have, have a remain name? an unanswered question. Does, does the boat have a name? Do you have a name of the boat? No, no, no. no. Question here. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. yeah, an additional comment. Actually, there are quite a few Russians from the flotilla who stayed on in the Philippines, including one of the Stark's officers, Roman Sturmer, who eventually became a Russian Orthodox priest and served here in San Francisco. And by the, the parish that was mentioned in Manila, they had a publication, we have two copies of it, it was called Manilsky Blagovesnik, modeled on Kitaisky Blagovesnik, which was issued in China. <laughs> so it's, that's a very rare publication as well. In our museum, yes. In our museum, yes. yes. And uh, some, uh, then another family that stayed in the Philippines, they even had a private library, but we've seen their book stamps, the Chernetsky family. Supposedly, uh, Chernetsky was, a, again, a naval officer. His grandchildren have been looking for his diary. They've looked everywhere, and they're thinking, maybe we have, but we don't. It hasn't turned up, and I haven't seen it anywhere. Perhaps uh, he was a member of the Society of Russian Veterans of the Great War, and I'm thinking that he may have donated it to them, and they may have sent it on to Moscow. Can I just add, um, according to the lists that I have, which are from archives, um, 812 people arrived in Manila, 527 boarded the Merit, a three-month-old baby died at sea, so that leaves over 300 people in the Philippines. Question. Uh, my name is Rosemary Nam. I'm on the board of the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. And I know Ms. Sakovich and Ms. Bailey have worked with Grant Din with our organization. I heard about this um, program through him. So I wanted to come and say hello and represent myself. And thank you so much for a substantive program. Um, this is, of course, all a part of our foundation mission, which is to educate the community and preserve the history of all who came through Angel Island when it was opened as the main port of entry from 1910 to 1940. And um, so I just wanted to let all of you know about our foundation. We are very active. We are very enthusiastic at all times, finding out about this history, and I learned a lot more than I did before I came, of course, and I would love to find out about that poet poem and see if there's an Angel Island connection. Thank you. I was in the American Navy uh, from uh, in the station of the Philippines from 1959 to 1961. And uh, I met a number of people who probably descended from the groups that were, you know, came to the Philippines in the early, in the early 20s. And uh, there was one man, his name was Adamovich. He later moved to San Francisco after, you know, after 19, 1960, 1965. He worked for Standard Oil Operations in the Philippines and was very instrumental in, in helping uh, when the Japanese, he was stateless, he was not an American citizen at the time, and he helped to support uh, the people who had been working for Standard Oil in the Philippines. And his name was Andamovich, and his, son, his 
he, he was the son of General Adamovich, who was li lived in Los Angeles when I was in Los Angeles uh, in my teens. Uh, and so there were, and also I remember we traveled to uh, Hong Kong and met a number of Russians who were living in Hong Kong, and there was, I think there was a Russian ch Orthodox Church in, in, in Hong Kong also. So there were plenty of people that, you know, also stayed in the area for longer. Speaking about Philippines, actually uh, many uh, Roman passengers from the Marriott, not many, but a few of them, returned back to the Philippines. Because when it was Great Depression, they were not able to find job, and they work in the Philippines. And when World War II started, uh, at least from uh, what I know, one person, uh, Grishkevich, he was a prisoner of the war. And if you uh, watch the movie, uh, Angelina Jolie movie, uh, um, Un Unbroken, it was the same story, the, the same story. And uh, many naval officers from the uh, Marriott, they continued their naval career here in the United States. And they um, were in service and they returned, they traveled a lot uh, between San Francisco and the Philippines. And some of them actually uh, were on the board of passengers uh, of ships that brought here uh, our Russian refugees from Kubabao after World War II. So this is additional. Ну что, давайте, please, let's congratulate each other. I think it was a success.